Chapter 4, Compliant Patients Are the Best, How a Large HMO Ensures Patient Compliance with a Full Vaccine Schedule. Tim liked working for Presley Churchill Medical Group. Although it was not the nation's largest HMO, it was thriving and provided him with a steady job in pediatrics. The only thing he didn't like was their vaccine policy. Not that he didn't like vaccines. Dr. Tim Ellington was as pro-vaccine as every other pediatrician. But like a growing number of doctors, he also felt that nowadays there were too many vaccines too soon. Babies didn't need hepatitis B vaccine. Skipping vaccines for mostly harmless diseases like chickenpox and rotavirus was fine with him. And there was no harm in delaying vaccines for things that were eliminated, like polio, especially since today's polio vaccine did not prevent the spread of the disease. As long as people eventually got all the important ones, flexibility was fine with him. And when he'd first started working for Presley Churchill, there was no company-wide policy. But 10 years ago, that had changed. The higher-ups had decided to group as many doses into each infant and toddler checkup as they could, and to no longer allow any flexibility for their patients. For the two-, four-, and six-month checkups, this new policy was no different than what every other pediatrician did, and that was fine. DTAP, Hib, PC, Hep B, polio, and rotavirus each time. That's what the CDC schedule called for, and that's what all doctors did. But 10 years ago, the Presley Churchill policymakers, headed by Dr. Jack Thompson, initiated a change that mandated all the toddler vaccines be grouped into one visit at 12 months of age. And this was something very different than what most non-Presley Churchill doctors did, and it was different than what the CDC recommended. The standard CDC schedule had always been MMR, varicella, which is chickenpox, and hepatitis A at 12 months, Hib and pneumococcal at 15 months, and DTAP and polio at 18 months. That's what most pediatricians nationwide did. They spread them out. This also allowed for more checkups during this second year of life. But the CDC also had flexible age ranges on their schedule, which allowed doctors to give these vaccines as early as 12 months. And that's what Presley Churchill decided to implement for all patients. So they gave MMR, varicella, Hep A, Hib, pneumococcal, and DTAP and polio all together at the 12-month checkup. Vaccination against 11 diseases. And the patients had no idea. Since these 11 could be grouped into just five injections, Patients didn't think it was that much different than the earlier infant shots. They weren't offered alternatives, and they didn't know that vaccines were spaced out in most medical settings outside the HMO. And since that time, he'd seen more toddlers react poorly to this 12-month round of vaccines than he'd seen in the first part of his career when these second-year vaccines were all spread out. He'd seen more seizures, more temporary developmental regression, more encephalitis-like reactions, screaming and high fevers, more chronic and recurrent illnesses in the toddler population than ever before. So many of these toddlers spent the next year or two suffering recurrent ear infections and colds and developed allergies and eczema. Of course, he couldn't prove this was due to the vaccine policy, but he knew it from his daily observations of life as a Presley Churchill pediatrician. He was angry that this grouping of vaccines had never, ever, not even once, been studied for safety. When the FDA approved them, they were spread out. But Presley Churchill decided to give them all together anyway, for convenience, they said. Get them all done at 12 months and we don't have to bother with any at 15 or 18 months. Each patient was simply reassured that having a seizure, screaming for hours, high fever, and shutting down for a few weeks was normal and expected. 
and getting ear infections and allergies in the weeks to follow was simply coincidental. And their clientele, the patients of Presley Churchill, were completely clueless. The minority who did ask for vaccines to be spread out were simply told no. Sure, patients could refuse any vaccines they didn't want for their children, but the harassment they had to endure from the Presley Churchill nurses was inhuman. He'd heard the nurses yelling at non-compliant patients through closed doors. Doctors, too. And he'd watched nurses roll their eyes in a huff as they grudgingly gave fewer shots to those who stood their ground. Then there were the constant phone calls and emails sent to patients who were behind on their shots. And there wasn't a thing he could do about it because he had to follow orders in a group like this. And today was the annual policy meeting for his branch of Presley Churchill. Tim was on the policy board, and he tried, subtly, to prevent this vaccine policy from being enacted, but to no avail. He dreaded what Dr. Thompson would try to add to the vaccine schedule this year. Not that there's anything left to add, is there? If there is, Jack will find it. As the meeting came to order, Tim would discover he was wrong, and right. And so, I propose that we add the flu shot to all 12-month checkups that occur during flu season, which would be from October through April. And as you know, babies need two doses of the flu shot the first year it's given, so they'll have to come back a month later for the second dose. But if we mix it in with the other five shots at 12 months, the parents won't even notice, and we'll raise our compliance numbers up above 95%, at least for the first flu dose. Currently, we are below 70% on the flu shot, and that's because when we ask parents if they want their baby to have a flu shot, many say no, because many parents don't bother with one for themselves. This new approach gives them less opportunity to say no. Oh, also, we are going with the same mandatory face mask policy this year again for anyone who doesn't want to get the flu shot. Not the patients, just the medical staff, us. I'd like to hear if anyone has any concerns about these changes. Tim felt all of the two dozen eyes of the table turn toward him, since they all knew he was the only one who ever objected to pass the vaccine consolidation. He already knew it would be futile to argue with the mask-wearing policy, and it didn't affect him anyway. He'd had several conversations about this with his sister, Anna, who was an ICU nurse. I can't believe she's willing to wear a mask for six months out of each year. He knew her reasons for not wanting the flu shot. Their grandma had had a severe Guillain-Barre reaction to one decades ago. But Tim figured the shots were harmless to him now, since he hadn't had any problems with the first few. And as for this new flu vaccine policy, he also knew it wouldn't do any good to voice his observations about what he thought the current 12-month vaccines were doing to their clients. And he noticed the way Jack called it five shots at 12 months, instead of the 11 vaccines that were in those five injections. 11, now 12 with the flu. Sounds like an overload. Five just sounds like a routine. But there was one very valid scientific argument he could make, not that it would do any good either. My main concern, Jack, would be seizure-related adverse events, he began. We already know that the MMR slash varicella combo shot we give has a higher seizure rate compared to giving these two separately a seizure rate of 1 in 1,250, according to the CDC. We also know that other vaccines feature seizure reactions in their product inserts, like hepatitis A vaccine and DTAP, of course. But the CDC also warns about seizures when we combine the flu shot with pneumococcal vaccine at the same visit. That warning is on their VIS forms. The data show a seizure rate of about 1 in 1,600 when you give both shots on the same day. I think we are already seeing more seizure reactions than we should, 
and throwing the flu shot in there will give us even more. And any of my patients who have had seizures with these shots don't want any more. It really interferes with future compliance. Well, that's an even better reason to give them all at 12 months and get them over with, Jack countered, letting out a genuine laugh. Then there wouldn't be any more shots for patients to argue about until the two-year visit when we give the next hepatitis A vaccine, and by then they won't be as scared. And despite the seizure risk, the CDC still allows this grouping of shots, and they do not advise against grouping PC with the flu shot, so we are just following CDC recommendation on this. Then why the hell don't all other pediatricians out in the real world do this? Tim didn't say. But we may see a drop in compliance with the second dose of the flu shot a month later if parents see their baby didn't do well with the 12-month shots. Well, they'll be in plenty of times for ear infections and such in the months to come, so there'll be plenty of opportunity to fix that. You know how toddlers like to get sick. But speaking of compliance with vaccines in general, we also have a new staff member who's going to help with that. I'd like to introduce Lisa Goodman, nodding toward a new woman in the room whom Tim hadn't noticed yet. She is a social worker and will be helping with all family-related problems among our patients. Domestic disputes, family dynamics, you name it. She's here to help. Every single Presley Clinic nationwide will have one by the end of this year. What does that have to do with vaccine compliance, Tim asked. Well, for one, she is going to start meeting with every prenatal family in the OB department to make sure everyone around that little baby-to-be is vaccine compliant. The pregnant mom's TDAP and flu shots, the grandparents' and dads' TDAP, MMR, and flu shots, the siblings' vaccines, everyone. Lisa will help identify any holes in a family's cocooning strategy. You know, the idea that if we surround every newborn with a cocoon of vaccinated people, that newborn will be safer. She will advise the parents on how they can best keep any non-compliant family members away from the new baby for its first year or two of life. Believe me, any grandma, aunt, or godparent who has to choose between compliance and family is going to make the right choice. No one wants to miss out on holding that precious little baby in their arms, right? We hope to achieve 100% compliance with all cocooning vaccines. But we all know the cocooning strategy was shown to be ineffective because the Tdap vaccines and flu vaccines don't prevent disease transmission, objected Tim. Looking around the table, he saw a few others nod their heads. Are the OBs still actually telling their patients that these vaccines protect a newborn? Well, yeah, of course they are. Once we institute a system-wide policy like that and everyone starts following it, we can't just call it quits when a new study or two shows it might not work. Besides, even if the flu and Tdap vaccines don't provide any real cocooning benefit for the baby, they're still important for all people to get. Bottom line is that encouraging all family members to get all their vaccines so they can be part of a new baby's life works. The reasoning behind it shouldn't matter. Tim didn't even know what to say to that. Back when newborn cocooning was first proposed, and government agencies began advertising flu and Tdap vaccines to expectant families, everyone just assumed that the vaccines would prevent disease transmission. When follow-up studies showed that vaccinating grandparents, dads, and siblings against whooping cough and flu does not actually prevent disease transmission, Tim assumed everyone would have gotten word to stop promoting the vaccines that way, but then he realized that was a foolish assumption. Of course they'll keep promoting them as beneficial. Why wouldn't they? But to tell a family not to let other family members around, just because they know enough to not get the shots? That was just cruel. But Tim wasn't prepared for what his boss said next. But that's only part of our new social service department's role. 
Moving forward, every family who refuses vaccines or asks to get them done outside of our set schedule will be informed that they are going to meet with our on-site social worker. Lisa will discuss the concerns they have, then inform them that she will be keeping a file open on them in case they'd like to discuss their vaccine concerns later, again at another date. What good is that going to do? It sounds like it's just some extra paperwork and expense. Well, it's all in how you present it to your patients, Tim. I plan to tell each one of my patients who refuses vaccines that I would like them to discuss the situation with our social worker, who is in touch with the Department of Child and Family Services. I will let them know that if our social worker has any concerns about how the family feels about vaccines, she can pass her concerns on to child services, and a social worker from the government department can come out to the family's home and talk with them about vaccines too. Wait, what? You're going to report non-vaccinating families to Child Protective Services? Seriously? Like, for child abuse? Listen, Tim, I'm not the only doctor who feels that failing to fully vaccinate constitutes child neglect. I'm just letting these patients know that I take the well-being of their children seriously. Believe me, any patient who is on the fence about vaccines and is thinking about refusing them will certainly cave when they realize that they'll have CPS at their door. But legally speaking, refusal to vaccinate is not even a reportable offense. CPS wrote that into their rules a few years ago. Even if you or Miss Goodman here, nice to meet you, Lisa, file a report, they aren't going to even do anything about it. They aren't going to even call the parents. You know that. Yeah, but the patients don't. Compliance, Tim. It's all about compliance. Oh, and that reminds me about the other policy change that will increase compliance. We are doing away with the CDC VIS forms. Silence around the table. Silence of agreement, Tim wondered. What do you mean do away with them? They're from the CDC. We can't just, I mean, we are no longer going to provide them to patients, finished Jack. No more informed consent process prior to vaccines. It's a waste of time. And it only scares the patients and leads to more questions. But most importantly, we are not required by law to provide them. Yes, we are, countered Tim. The National Vaccine Injury Compensation Act instructs doctors to show patients the VIS forms before it instructs us, Tim. It can't make us do it. Vaccine-informed consent is under the jurisdiction of each state, not the federal government. Our state does not demand informed consent for vaccination, so we aren't going to do it anymore. The patients can just read the damn forms on their own at home if they want to. Tim, again, was at a loss for words.